thank you for being here, folks, this morning. Heather's going to sit it out because she's had the same problem I have with her throat. So the um, what infrastructure is needed to quickly and efficiently scale regional food systems. The session will highlight current successful models in our region which optimize getting regional food from farm and fisher to the local consumer's table. So we have Reed Neville from the Cape Breton Food Hub, Heather and Rebecca from the Station Food Hub, Dan Rubin from Grow, uh, Food Producers Forum, and Diane Gonzalez, Grower Station. So PEI, Cape Breton, uh, mainland Nova Scotia, <laughs> and Newfoundland. So I'm going to ask each of you who, anybody prefer who starts? What, what did we say? Yeah, I think that is we, said, we had you planning to start. And part of the reason is that uh, in contrast to these people, although I do have a garden, uh, we're not quite as much fingers in the dirt as they are. Uh, we are rather a communications hub created as an outflow from a project called the Earth Sheltered Greenhouse Project, which is now involved in building uh, climate battery greenhouses uh, in six communities across our province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the context and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my own story. Unfortunately, as you've heard bits of it already, I talk a lot, I'm a retired teacher. I retired from education as a curriculum developer, school principal, burned out with that. Parents had me for breakfast. Uh, in 2002, moved to Newfoundland and found a waterfront house in a little town called Pooch Cove, just north of St. John's. And I have a beautiful garden that I inherited from the old timer who built the house. And the adventure has taken me from that to becoming a seedsman. I have a heritage seed company and then leading workshops because God knows I need to talk. And over the last 10 years, I've had pre done presentations to 1,500 people. And that's a litmus test of the level of growing interest in growing your own food. There are thousands of new gardeners. So where have we come from? Well, Newfoundland and Labrador was once the most food secure and healthy province in Canada. And now by a margin, we are the least healthy and the least food secure. We've lost the bulk of our farm production. Uh, we're, we've become people who drive our four by fours to the Sobeys and buy the food that has come to us from far away. And the story that I love to tell is about the grapes. The grapes come from Chile most of the year. They're shipped to Mississauga, Ontario, where they're loaded into a refrigerated truck and driven across Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Cape Breton, and then they get to the ferry at North Sydney and they wait a couple of days uh, while the refrigerators hum and then they load onto the ferry for the short six hour crossing to Port of Basque. And after they get to Port of Basque, they drive 10 hours across the island and they unload in a warehouse in Mount Pearl, which is kind of, I grew up in, spent a lot of my early days in Vancouver. It's kind of like the Burnaby of St. John's. <laughs> the Pearl, we call it the Pearl. And they're unloaded and those grapes, those same grapes that have been grown in Chile are loaded back into a smaller refrigerated truck and in many cases driven back 10 hours across the island. People on the West Coast uh, uh, in the Gross Morn area, you may know of Gross Morn <laughs> National Park, told us that they're very used to cutting mold off peppers because that's how their vegetables and fruit get there. And so um, what has happened recently, of course, is climate change and COVID and rising food prices. So participation in local food banks has doubled. Donations have decreased by 80%. We've confirmed that during a conference we held in May where Jody Williams of Bridges to Hope spoke about that. So many more people realize there is a need for healthy food. 
We have a Facebook page called Backyard Farming and Homesteading. There are 33,000 people on that site, about 27,000 of whom are local residents. And so there are groups, there's Food First NL doing amazing work around policy and the practical details of food distribution and food need. Our group formed three years ago out of the project designing and building earth sheltered greenhouses. And uh, we're, we're a wonderful group in that we have representation within our board of directors from people who grew up in India a single parent engineering student from West Africa, a woman who is an ecologist trained in South America, indigenous representatives from Labrador, a local farmer, local greenhouse operator at Memorial University Botanical Gardens, uh, myself, I don't know what the heck I am, a guy with a garden in Puchkov, and uh, an IT manager at the university. So we're very diverse, very multicultural, very gender balanced, and it's a great group. And boy, do they keep me from making foolish decisions. Because what we learned, and we learned this during our process with designing the Earth Sheltered Greenhouse, is that it's not a sound decision unless everybody speaks. So we've thrown Robert's Rules of Order out the window, and we do the talking circle. I call it making decisions in living color. If everybody speaks to the decision, you fine tune it, you trim it. It's like Michelangelo, when they asked him how he made the sculpture, he said, well, I cut away everything that wasn't the sculpture. And that's what you do with a group. And so we've got projects that include a conference that wrapped in May, three days, 32 speakers, and Mary Bloody Walsh as our conference chair. It was great. And we did that with a very small budget. I was about five, six thousand uh, dollars. We've launched a provincial survey where we're surveying community food producers, and we did that with zero dollars budget, total volunteer energy for a very well-designed online survey. And what we see the need for right now, to sum up, is that we need to replace the two current broken systems food as commodity and food as charity with a third option. And that's what we we're talking about during this conference, right? Is those incredibly complex bits and pieces of food producers, processors, distributors, to create a system where people are not singled out for their poverty and where all of us can get healthy food. We believe the solutions lie at the community level. That's why we're building the greenhouses. We also in Newfoundland and Labrador and in many other places need a sea change in the attitude about food, about where it is, where it comes from. We need education. I'm a retired school principal. I taught in a school that had a raised bed garden where kids grew half the food for the lunch program and turned, took turns cooking and serving it. Uh, we need food back in the schools and in our communities at all level. And we especially need to use our digital communication systems to talk to each other. The problem is the isolation. The problem is the silos. So as a communications group, we're working on connecting people. I'll stop there. I am. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Diane Gonzalez from Grower Station and PEI. Uh, so Grower Station is a non-for-profit corporation uh, in charge of sales and distribution of uh, local food products. Today, we're working with roughly 45 different producers across the island, and we are supplying product to approximately 60 accounts uh, between food service industry, uh, institutions, uh, retail stores, and uh, direct-to-consumers. Uh, this initiative was basically brought forward by a group of farmers back in January of 2020, 2021 in collaboration with the COPC, which is the Certified Organic Producers Co-op of the island. And uh, in July of 2021, I took over the business from a paper pretty much and tried to turn it into an operation. Uh, in difference with some of these sort of food hubs over here, which are a bit more focused in processing and um, maybe retail, we try to put our attention mainly in distribution and sales because uh, mainly four reasons. One of them was, was what was requested by the farmers. 
when they came forward saying like, we need a solution to face this uh, increase in volume that we are facing since uh, COVID-19 came. Mm -hmm. And they really didn't have the infrastructure in place to go after the, the bigger guys that are out there selling product directly to wholesale accounts. The second reason for this was the, the, the amount of infrastructure really required to get a distribution company going. To get started, it was just going to be me with the help of four farmers. And um, they were going to slowly start transferring the business volume towards the company. But to get started, really all we needed to do was to build a platform where we can expose these products that they have in the farm and then somehow get them from the farm into the different location. It's a, what is called in the logistics industry as a milk run. You pick it all and deliver it all in the same day, try to keep a very simple system. The third reason for this, I thought, it, and I, I feel like it's probably one of the most important is uh, building convenience and consistency around the smaller and medium sized operations. Uh, nobody, it, it is not a secret that that's probably one of the main, uh, main sales drivers in the world today. Uh, if you don't really have convenience when you're going to buy a product, you're probably not going to get it. And uh, today we have systems in place that are like extremely easy to, to work with, like Cisco, uh, GFS, all of these big companies that they pretty much uh, are able to supply all the needs that you have as a company within a phone call. But unfortunately, uh, the, the local producers were pretty much doing this independently. So as a farmer, if you're trying to sell your harvest or whatever you're growing in your farm and you have to go to the back door of a restaurant, you might be able to sell something. But when the second farmer comes and knock at your back door, it's kind of becoming an inconvenience for you. So what you're going to say, like, no, I don't want to deal with this. And you're going to pass from the local products. So we build a platform. We didn't build it, it was built before. We just, we just used the platform to host our site where we gave the opportunity to the farm to go in and actually create a profile and list whatever products they had ready to be harvested within, their, within the season or within the year, whatever they had available for sale. Uh, when you put one farm in that platform, it is not really very impressive, but when you put 45 different farms <coughs> there, then all of a sudden you're not selling 10 pounds of lettuce, you're selling 7,000 pounds of lettuce, which was the number of lettuce that we sold within this season to restaurants. So the other reason for the, I guess, the, and, the other, and, and the other part of this uh, same reason is uh, basically consistency. So when you teach this client that the order has to be in within this time, and we're gonna be in your restaurant by this time, then the, the system becomes very easy. So the quality of the product, it is extremely higher. And when you show up at the back door of a restaurant with a product that was basically harvested that morning and it was put together and clean and it's within three hours there, like they're gonna want it. The price point, even though it's a bit higher, and this was an experiment that we ran with a restaurant, this uh, guy basically started buying lettuce from us. And the way he explained it was that uh, even though he was putting more money up front because the lettuce was a bit higher because of the longevity of that lettuce in the fridge, he didn't have to buy as much and there wasn't as much waste. So it turned out to be about the same cost for him. So as I said, when in the first season, we, we tried to get within the restaurant industry and we had a very hard time. It was a no go for everybody. It was like, no, we're not touching you. And then slowly we started making a name around and slowly and today their biggest volume that the biggest client that we have within, uh, and I'd say we're probably $300,000 in produce put into the back doors of a restaurant. And the fourth reason for this was uh, uh, there has to be a way to build a system that is willing to sacrifice uh, profitability. Uh, unfortunately, today we're working uh, with uh, companies that measure success based on how much money they get back and how much money they're actually able to get from what they're doing. But that doesn't really give a chance to the smaller and medium-sized operation, which in PI, the, the farming is probably one of the biggest uh, GDP drivers in the province, but those farms are not the ones that are putting food on the table. Those farms are the ones that are sending potatoes to the United States, sending potatoes to other places or grain products. 
But when you work with 45 farms that have between 20 to 35 different products growing, mm -hmm. those are the ones that are feeding the families. Those are the ones that at the end of the day, when they go to the market, are gonna be able to supply when the bridge shut down and we're not able to get a Cisco truck to supply the other guys. So if we don't really sacrifice and not measure the level of our business based on return, and we give these people a chance to actually build the production level up to standard, to market standard needs, and build the quality of what they're offering. And we teach them that, you know what, you're charging this for this product, but this other farm is charging this for this product, which we become pretty much a price regulator within our own farmers. Then they're never gonna have a chance to break into the distribution channels. So we're pretty much taking the hit for the time being. Hopefully at some point we'll get a bit more support from the government to keep on doing what we're doing. And as I said, I like to say that I measured like the success that I have when I show up at the back door of a restaurant and the guy says like, amazing. I'm gonna throw all this product that I just got yesterday <laughs> because it's not good. And when I see the guy calling me because like, I'm running out of lettuce and I need your lettuce or I need your whatever carrots. And, and that's how I measure success today. When I had a farm that doubled production this year because they were expecting that we were gonna supply, that we were gonna bring sales and they doubled the amount of crops that were growing and they still weren't able to feed the, the, or to supply the needs that we had, that that's success to me. So I like to think that we're doing pretty good in what we're doing. And as I said, we're a bit different. We're planning at some point, hopefully move into some of those sectors because like, no matter what, we have to make money. At the end of the day, we have to at some point become self-sufficient. And uh, we, we're in the process of getting there. But like I said, it, it was very important to do what we're doing very well first, have that pin down, build that basically the name around the company or they were a brand. And once you have that brand, then it's pretty much word of mouth, especially in PIs, <laughs> where everybody talks about us today. I'll pass the mic to you. Hi everyone, my name is Maura Neville. I'm the executive director for the Cape Breton Food Hub. We're a not-for-profit cooperative. Um, I feel a little bit like a fraud up here because I began my role in July of this year. So a lot of the work was done before I even got there, but we're still in process of developing and growing. So the Food Hub began in 2015 and it was established and created to help producers of Cape Breton Island have a focal point to send their product and get it to more customers right around Cape Breton Island. Um, it is a large island, so we're based right in the middle and we have producers two and a half hours away that sell product to customers four hours away every week. Um, so that's where it began. And then in 2020, Alicia Lake was the executive director and she noticed that Due to the weather that we get, our farmers are very limited in what they can produce and when they can produce it. So she started the, the push for a processing facility in our building that we have in Bordeaux. And she fought really hard to get the funding and managed to get it through a COA and through some uh, private sponsors and things like that. And it was developed again just for the farmers so that they could elongate their selling period of their product. So if they had carrots or peas or anything like that left over at the end of the season, bring it to our building, rent the processing unit. It's amazing, you bring it in, it washes, it slices, it peels, it cuts, it does everything. So it's quite an impressive unit itself. And then we have a walk-in freezer, you can put those in there, store there and sell it from there. And then the bigger plan was that you could start reaching out to bigger industries like the hospitals and the, um, the schools to sell on a larger scale than we had been. So the money was got, we got our processing unit, it was fantastic, COVID hit and everything shut down. <laughs> so the processing unit to date has actually only been used once um, and it was with rhubarb. And it was amazing to see the process of bringing in you know, 1,400 pounds of rhubarb and processing it within eight hours. So that was a great experience for us to have. 
And then, as Krista mentioned yesterday, um, the Department of Agriculture approached us and asked, would we be interested in doing a pilot project similar to what Station Food Hub had done um, on the mainland, but we would work with carrots. And we thought this is a great opportunity. We can get into the institutions. The uh, pilot would be just directly with the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. And we thought this is great. But then regulations kicked in because we were no longer working on a provincial level, we're working on a federal level. So right now we're in almost a limbo land of we need more equipment. Now we're working with institutions, things have to be done a certain way. We need more equipment for killing bacteria before it's frozen, things like that. So we're working on getting the money to buy the next portion of the processing unit so that we can work with institutions. Uh, we have to be CFIA certified, we have to be federally licensed, so there's far more to the processing unit than we envisaged, envisioned uh, when we took on the pilot project. But we're working really closely with the Department of Education and they're really supportive of everything that we're doing and we're trying to push it as, forward as fast as we can. So the hope is that by March we'll have everything in place to get going again. Our second barrier, I suppose, is that Cape Breton doesn't have a whole lot of big farms. So we visited Wolfville recently and there's a lot of big farms. So if you go to a farmer and say, I need a thousand pounds of carrots, there are few farmers that you can speak to. Whereas Cape Breton, it's more the small farming community and they get scared. So if you say to them, grow me a thousand pounds of carrots and they'll say, yeah, but that will go to waste. And you're saying, no, we'll buy it and we'll, we'll process it and it will be fine. So the next barrier is to prove to our Cape Breton farmers, we can do this. This is viable. This is profitable for you. So we're going to work very closely with our producers and our farmers to ensure that once we get up and going, that they will benefit from this and they'll see the benefit of doing this with us. So there's a few barriers there and the biggest one and something that's been spoken about quite a bit over the last few days is the regulations and the rules and the licensing like that is really slowing everything down. Um, part of the licensing is going to be a three month, month audit of our building. So, you know, you can't do anything till all of that is done and it makes it exceptionally hard and coming in in July as a new executive director, we have a brand new board, everything is new. So taking all of this on, plus the weekly distribution that we do, plus supporting the farmers in the way that we do. And we have a share of the harvest program that supports low income families. So we're doing all of this. And then every step we get for the processing unit, there's a holdup of rules and regulations kick in. So that would be my thing, I suppose, is that there'd be a larger discussion across Nova Scotia, across Canada about the rules and regulations that slow everything down. Try and make it simpler, try and make it easier, try and remove some of the rules that are in place because some of them seem a little crazy. <laughs> and they're brought in because something happened and they reacted and then we're stuck with it. So that would be where I'm at and I'm excited for where the Food Hub will go from here. Um, I'm excited to be part of it. And this has been a really great weekend to meet people who are doing the same thing as we do, because we feel a little isolated down in Cape Breton. Um, we're not part of the mainland, but it's been really great to talk to people and see what they do. So thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca, and uh, my, my partner, Heather, is sitting there. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to come because she's a little bit hoarse, but she was spoke yesterday. Um, I just wanted to start off by taking us back to the early 2018, and um, we hosted a dinner party at my house. Linda was invited from FarmWorks, a couple other board members. Heather came. I'd never met Heather before, and um, we both kind of uh, sat at this around the table and talked about a lot of the issues that we're talking about here today. Uh, we brought out a big piece of paper and we started drawing on it. Um, Linda put a building in the middle and said, we need a processing infrastructure to connect these farmers to the markets, the institutions, and that's where the buying power is. And that's how we're going to make a difference for Nova Scotia to keep uh, local food here on the province. So Heather and I kind of pulled ourselves away from the table and we, we were, um, She's a grew up on a dairy farm in Montreal, moved to Nova Scotia 12 years ago. She had a um, Pyre Square, a, 
a small like a food business selling to markets and retail. I've been working as a dietitian for 20 years, working in school systems, long-term care, public health, uh, seeing the barriers to getting local food into institutions. And so we started um, understanding that we had a shared vision of what could happen, but we just needed to go and build it. So we both left the work that we had been doing for a number of years and set um, out talking to farmers, going, we visited um, a lot of uh, people. We uh, tried to understand what, what it is that we were trying to build here. We went down the route of trying to set up a nonprofit. We went to talk to government about funding. We, we struggled a lot to try to figure out what it was gonna look like and how this was gonna happen. And we ended up deciding that we are gonna form a partnership. We have a business and it's incorporated. And we went and got loans from the banks, from FarmWorks, CBDC, BDC. We're personally invested in what we're doing and we believe that it's the right thing to do. Uh, we found a 17,000 square foot school. We bought it. It's on nine acres of land that we own. And uh, this was all around 2018, 2019. We needed to rebuild the water system in the school. It's run off of rainwater now. We have cisterns that, uh, that operate the whole building on rainwater. We've had to redo the whole power in the building. And we had to update the cafeteria kitchen and the buildings from the 60s, so there's a lot of things that had to get done on that. So again, um, because it's just Heather and I, we can sit down together and make decisions in a matter of 10 minutes without having to answer to a lot of different people, and things can move quickly. And um, we have we call in advisors when we need to, and we have a lot of people that come in and, and help us with consulting and um, and that sort of thing. When it comes to the regulation part, they're there for a reason, and we understand that, and we. We work with some really great people that give us uh, advice on how to like set up our space and set up the systems in place ahead of time. And so we're ready for when CFIA came and we passed our audit and we did all, like everything was, was fine. Um, but understanding that those are challenges, we, we knew that we wanted to support other small businesses and entrepreneurs and farmers. So we set up our commercial kitchen. We had businesses coming in and renting from us to help build and scale their business. We have these classrooms at the other end of the building where people can come and we have two businesses that have their processing space in there and they're selling to all of the grocery store chains. They're exporting product out of our building. We are uh, CFIA inspected. So we have storage, we have fridges and freezers. Uh, we have dry storage that people come and, and use um, our storage facilities. We have a staff of seven now, and we have chefs and we have bakers. We no longer rent out the small commercial kitchen because we've realized that if we have control over that kitchen, we're able to now use that space and do the things in there that we need to do. We have um, four co-packing contracts. So we do co-packing on site for other businesses. So we make Haskat jams, we make chai tea, we package seaweed for another company. So every day looks a little different, but it's very exciting. And we're always laser focused on local food and, um, and the need to drive um, that into um, institutions and other um, places. So you may have all heard about the potato store. I'm not gonna go into that, but we are recognized right now as one of 12 businesses across Canada. There's only two in Atlantic Canada that are participating in a food waste reduction challenge. So Agri-Food Canada, the federal government, put out a competition. We submitted an application for a food waste idea, which was to go speak to farmers in Nova Scotia, ask what their seconds or their, the product that was being left in the field. And in, in Nova Scotia, I mean, everywhere, there's a lot of product that's left in the field. Um, we looked at potatoes, cauliflower, sweet potatoes, carrots, all these products that could feed all the Atlantic provinces and they're being left out in the field. So we recognize that if we could find a way to pay the farmer what it's worth for those products, bring them to our facility, process them in a federally inspected place that meets all the regulations. We've partnered with Nova Scotia Health. We partner with Gordon Food Services. We meet all the vendor requirements that they need to be able to distribute the product um, into the local institutions. So kind of solving all those like little challenges that really aren't, they're doable to fix. 
now we make product, we sell it to Gordon Food Services and they distribute it across the whole province. So that takes out the need for us to kind of try to get it in all these different places. But um, we won the first round. So we won $100,000 prize money, which was like, here you go, right? Like, it was awesome. <laughs> so, and that was on an idea of what we were gonna do. So we took the $100,000 and we built our processing facility. So we bought the specialized equipment, we bought the freezers, we bought all of that. We hired staff with that $100,000 and then we submit it to the next round and we, we advanced to the, we're in the finals now. So we won $400,000. Like, so that's a huge amount of money. And we are so excited the day that we found that out. And now we've taken that and we've bought even more equipment. We've bought a delivery truck now. We've like, we're investing that money wisely. And, uh, and that's gonna take us to more products and more opportunities, more institutions, more places that we can, um, to make a bigger difference. And please cross your fingers for us because in March, we're going to find out if we win the finals, which is $1.5 million. And think of how much impact that could have if we actually um, we are recognized as an innovator for food waste reduction. So that's a big focus of our business. Uh, we know that there's lots of work to do and we're excited to kind of take that on. It's really um, really like I see all the people here today and um, listen to the stories and and know that we uh, partner and communicate with as many people as we can. And uh, we kind of fly by the seat of our pants some days and it's, um, it's, it's pretty fun, but it's a lot, a of, lot of hard work and we're up for the challenge. So I just wanted to share that little story. Thanks. Back when I was growing up, we had all kinds of facilities. FarmWorks saw the, the missing links and we're really pleased to have been able to help many businesses. And, um, and the fact that we were there for the inception of the food hub has been tremendous. And <clears throat> we would, while we only operate in, in Nova Scotia, um, we, I do spend quite a bit of time talking with people in other provinces, and um, I think Marie and I will be having some conversations in the very near future. So, so what question does each, does any one of you want to ask another one on the panel? It would be in communication all the way. You have an impressive restaurant clientele yes and that is something that the food hub has really struggled to break into um, we sell directly to customers and only have three restaurants on the island that work with us so my question would be how did you break that barrier so i have a background in culinary industry i used to cook for many years and uh, fortunate for me i had the inside friends <laughs> so, <laughs> <yes sir. clears throat> You start by building that relationship with a couple of the restaurants uh, and then the name kind of spreads around and we did a lot of uh, marketing during the winter months so what we do with our producers is we ask them to give us uh, samples and we go around and we basically harass the chefs and the owners <laughs> until they uh, and, and we understand that they're not going to move the whole purchasing model towards us but we ask them it's like listen we have these products during this season and we are able to supply whatever you need, whatever amount you need. So can you give us a try and just start with one product? And if it works from there, maybe you can start with the second product and things like that. So yeah, as I said, it, it took a lot of effort, but again, it, it's just a matter of breaking the ice. Once you break the ice and you actually prove that you can do it, because that was one of the questions is like, are you guys really gonna be able to supply when I have to buy that product? Are you gonna be here in time? When you work in a kitchen, there is really no, not a whole lot of time to deal with people showing at the back door. And, uh, and that was, it, it's just, I, I basically would woke up usually at 6 a.m. the first year and try to pack everything to be there in time. And like, it was, I don't know how I didn't get a lot of speeding tickets, but <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, lucky, but uh, no effort, I guess is the only way. And quality product is key. 
Any other questions between panel members? Okay, I'll open it up to the audience. Questions for any? Diane. 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 Diane from the uh, Grower Station. You referenced um, producers uh, sowing more, like planning to harvest more based on, um, yeah, based on your channel. And I guess I'm wondering, maybe also Cape Breton Food Hub, Station Food Hub, what has the impact of your of your activities been on actual expansion of of production on with the growers that you're working with and and has that displaced any yeah is it is it just all net positive or is it that some farmers are no longer selling through csas or or selling through um uh, farmers markets what what's been that impact yeah, so uh, the farmers, as I said at the beginning, kept their business model. They didn't change uh, what they were doing before. They're still dealing with their CSAs. They're still dealing with the farmer's market. They haven't changed that whatsoever. When we came into play, we weren't planning on taking away what they were dealing with. We were planning to be a support link. And uh, as we kind of became stronger, they realized, uh, you know what, these guys are doing a great job, so why would I not just past whatever I'm doing towards them. And you have to see that it, at this point, it doesn't really, it is not only about how much they're selling and how much is, it's more about how convenient this system has become. So this farmer, I'm dealing with 60 plus wholesale accounts. That farmer had to do 60 deliveries, 60 invoices, 60 accounts receivables, 60 clients that they had to call to see if they need products. So, I don't know where that disappeared. So now they're focusing on production and quality control. So that's probably one of the biggest benefits. Uh, I have a farmer, for example, most many of you might know, Sole Hutchinson. She's probably one of the greatest uh, farmers in PI when it comes to, uh, to everyday like food to table kind of thing. And she saw an increase in sales of uh, 30%, I believe. Yeah. 20%, but she also saw a reduction of like around $50,000 in savings that she didn't have to put towards dealing with any of these other aspects of her business model. So when you put that together, that, that's a big chunk of money there. So, and just her, as I was saying, she sold 7,000 pounds of lettuce through us. And so that's, that's a big, that's big business, I think, for somebody that is medium sized firm. Uh, so, so for the restaurant service, or for the food service industry, we sell the five five pound crate at forty dollars, so roughly eight, eight dollars a pound. So that's a great question. Um, when the health authority asked us if uh, we could get potatoes from Nova Scotia year round, I started calling farms because, and I'm not a farmer, and I don't know volumes, I don't know any of that type of stuff, and I was like. I don't know how much, how much potatoes do we actually grow in Nova Scotia and do we have them year round and all that kind of thing. And I asked a farmer, I said, well, we're, we're interested in your potatoes and would you have enough to supply us for all the hospitals? And he said, well, we grow about 3 million pounds a year and we're throwing, a, we're throwing out about 36,000, 360,000 pounds of seconds and waste products and things like that. So I think last year we, we used almost 100,000 of those pounds, but there's still more to go. Um, and when we talked to the cauliflower uh, producer, he leaves about a million pounds in the field a year. So, and uh, there was just a recent article about um, on in the paper about the fact that the amount that he leaves in the field could feed everybody in uh, in the province uh, just with what he leaves alone. So we're not we're not taking away from other sales of product. If anything, we're helping them find new markets, and we're paying them for that product because it costs the same amount to plant it. But uh, at least we're getting um, they're getting something for their dollar from from us taking it. Yeah, and for the Cape Breton Food Hub, the one thing that comes back from farmers is that we we deal with the distribution. We deal with customers. So they are now actually able to sell to more people than they would if they went to farmers markets. Um, a lot of them are still going because they have their loyal customer who will come to the farmers market, but they've reduced the number that they're going to. So a few of our, our producers, rather than the family dividing into three or four over different markets in different locations in Cape Breton, they're just going to one and then they'll sell through the food hub. 
And the other thing that they like too is that we deal with the social media aspect and like the selling of them as a producer. So we had a new producer who was only a year in business and through the hub, he was around maybe $200 a week. And we did a promotional video on himself, his wife and his farm. And the first week his sales shot up to $800 plus and he's never come back down again. So it, you know, they, they appreciate the fact that they don't have to worry about distribution. They don't have to worry about social media, that we take care of all of that for them. And the one thing we hear all the time is it allows us focus on our farm. We don't have to worry about that. We focus on our farm. So I think that's what they appreciate most. My, uh, my dad, when I was growing up, who was a very creative man, visual artist, uh, and a scientist at the same time, uh, had a saying. He said, you see the need, you do the deed. And these are such great examples of people doing exactly that, sitting around the kitchen table with a piece of paper and saying, what we need is... And uh, the story in our province, uh, which like Nova Scotia is a chunk of mainland and, a, and a, a big island, is somewhat different because the tradition was you grew your food. The farmhouse next door to me, which has been restored and turned into a, a, a hiker's stay, uh, had two families, two brothers living side by side in a divided duplex. And in the 1930s, when my dear friend Shirley, who's now 96, was born, and the man who built our house, um, there were the two brothers, um, and they were chalk and cheese. They wouldn't speak to each other. They knew better. One of them was a neat freak, and the other was like, oh, I'd do it. Uh, but their wives were amazing and held the whole thing together. So in that building lived those two couples and their parents and five children on one side and 11 on the other. There were 22 people living in the Langmead farmhouse and they did right well because in those days people got, grew and gathered their own food. And so the distribution and the farming, if you want to put those quotes on it, was very small scale. There were some, and there still are some large scale farms. There's egg producers, there's milk producers, but our milk leaves the island to be processed. So what is happening now in the rebuilding of our systems is kind of like a miniature version of the systems we're talking about here. And we did have a test of the Cape Breton Food Hub model uh, based in Corner Brook this past year. Uh, I had to stop for lack of funding, but it's going to be relaunched. And it worked really well. It moved thousands of pounds of vegetables from farms directly to consumers, restaurants, uh, using the same digital model. And it works, it works. And also digital tools work, as you mentioned, for promoting and changing people's views of where the food is, what it is, how to get it. So I wanna share one story because we're doing outreach and communication. <clears throat> We've designed this thing, I call it uh, the child, uh, the, the, the root cellar and the greenhouse met and they had a baby. So the way I say it to explain it to Newfoundlanders, it's a greenhouse with its arse in the earth. And once we were well underway with building our demonstration version of that, and because I have a friend who's built one and he was growing food all through our Snowmageddon snowfall event with a, a, an electrical heating cost of $5 a month, we knew it would work. So we sent the word out through Food First and on our own email, hey, we're looking for communities that want to build these earth sheltered greenhouses. And we expected we'd hear from half a dozen people and they'd be close by and we wouldn't have to travel very much. Oh my. <laughs> we got applications from 26 communities, from municipalities, from food co-ops, from uh, food banks. And so we had a committee and we had to pick six of these. And the one that beats them all is the letter from Casey Budgel, 14, student, Kings Point, Newfoundland. I read it and I went, oh my. And it said, we have a great community garden. I built it as my school project. Now we need this greenhouse. So of course we picked Casey. I didn't know whether it was a he or a she or a they and it did not matter. Nevertheless, this was a letter from a student 
and it was supported by a letter from the mayor of the small town. So I called her on the phone. I got Ryan Kelly at the school there, and he, he called her in from the classroom. I said, Casey? She said, yes. I said, were you excited? She said, I was standing on my chair in the classroom, pumping my fist in the air going, yes, yes. And I said, so tell me about your community. She said, well, we're traditionally an agricultural community at the end of a long ocean inlet. And we have all these farms, but we no longer grow food like we once did. And I think we have to do that. I think it's critical that we do that, she said. I said, yes, we agree. Well, we'll, we'll support you. She said, and we have the community garden and we've got the perfect tall, sandy, south facing hillside for the greenhouse. She says to me, and then I want to build a root cellar for the whole community where everybody puts their food. And in the middle of winter, if you need food, you just go there and get it. And I'm talking to the 14 year old in Kings Point. And I say to her, Casey, uh, you do realize that this is an advisory design phase. We're not providing any funding. Your community will have to raise about half of the cost for the materials. That's $10,000. She says, oh, I already did that. <laughs> I, I applied to the, the, the foundation in, in, in or Ontario. The money's in the bank. <laughs> so we travel to these six sites. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we travel to these six sites. And, and Tom Fleming and I, who's now a partner in Green Farm NL, a very successful hydroponics operation in the Pearl. You see, you know what that is now, the Pearl. Um, Anyway, we, we ended up standing outside in a field with a circle of 16 people. Casey, tall, blonde, athletic Casey, and her parents, two students, one of whom was eight years old who had brought muffins she had made, and the mayor of the town and the member of the House of Assembly and two members of the town council, one of whom was an engineer, and two local mining representatives and three farmers. And they all pointed at the 14-year-old and they said, she's in charge, we're doing what she says. <laughs> I could tell you about the Mi'kmaq far fabric artist and far organic farmer in the Codroy Valley who has formed the Codroy Community Service Garden, which grows in, a, in raised bed gardens and gives away every bit of food that they grow to local organizations. And when the roads washed out a year ago and the, the valley was inaccessible, they fed the community. They delivered food house to house. Or I could tell you about Nathan Gidge, who's farming on Kingfisher Farm, and he's a retired school principal, like myself, and he had had enough with that because there was enough focus on food in the school. So he's got a garden producing the CSA, 18 CSA boxes a week in the summer, and it's intentionally located in a gravel pit on a hillside in Gambo to show that that can be done. And he says, everything we need for soil resources is right here. We just need to go out and get it. So those are, those are snapshots of what's going on. But the contrast is that it's not quite as large scale or organized, but the principle is the same as my dad say, you see the need, you do the deed. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Hey, this one's for the Food Hub folks up there. Uh, so as Dan mentioned, we're kind of in the process of relaunching a Food Hub ourselves out in Western Newfoundland uh, that was very much patterned on the Cape Breton one. So maybe we're just thinking about you know, how to build the team. So maybe the question for the, the Food Hub folks is, if you could have one more person working for you, uh, what would they do? What job would you give them? Like, what's, what's, the, what's the gap? What would you really need the most help with? <laughs> the distribution portion is the biggest part. So for us in the Cape Breton Food Hub, we are the entire island, which I don't know what your model is, but you might be thinking like a large geography of the, the island. Um, we're spending over $1,000 a week on distribution for our producers. Um, we don't have our own distribution van, so we partner with a company that has the refrigerated trucks and they pick up in several locations from the producers around the island. 
it's brought back to us. We sort, we make it into customer individual orders, and then it's shipped out for customers to pick up. So we do have somebody in distribution, but it's the back end of printing everything that needs to be done, making sure everything goes to the right location for each week. But we certainly need somebody to help us on the delivery side, like have a delivery driver that goes around and picks up. Um, and Norma Jean, who's from Richmond River Roots here from Cape Breton, um, like they live, they're in River Bourgeois and their drop off is 30 minutes away in um, Arishat. So if we had our own person, we could like logistically make it easier for the farmers, but we would need somebody to oversee that, know where the farmers are each week, know where they were going, root it out. Like the logistics side of things is really important. Um, I would want somebody in every position if we could. <laughs> it's a lot. There's four staff. I'm the only full-time person and the rest work between five and 20 hours a week. So we have a lot that we need to do, but start and small and like put people in the key areas that you need for sure, because they're going to be the hardest part of how do I do it? Like after the storm we had in October, my poor husband, we're a not-for-profit and I rope him into everything. So like he's creating our videos, our social media and everything like that and doing his own job. But we rented a van and we drove the entire island and picked up from all the producers after the storm um, because it was Thanksgiving weekend that weekend. And we didn't want our producers to miss out on the opportunity to sell to the, the consumers. But those things are the, the areas where, you know, a lot of people think social media, website, things like that. It's the logistics side is where you definitely need to target for your employee. Yeah, it's the same case with us. Uh, I'm supposed to stay behind dealing with operations and the books and coordinate the farms and maintain the side. Uh, realistically, we don't have the extra guy. So in the morning, I have to jump in the van and go out, deal with distribution. And then at the end of the day, come back, sit behind the computer and deal with the rest of the day. So it's not that we didn't have support. We had that we had the, the salary there for the for the employees. Like I feel like PI faced this year the biggest lack of labor in the, in history. Like it was impossible to get people to work. So we had the I, there was a point that I actually offered people 37.5 hours a week to work for three days. And they still didn't get the job. So it was very challenging. And so we have, um, we have myself and Heather work full time. We have a full time production supervisor. We have three, four full time production line staff that oversee our sanitation program, our preventative maintenance program. We have a, a delivery driver now that's part time. We have a dishwasher that comes in, which has saved us a ton of time and increased production just by hiring that one position. We have a community food, food coordinator. I didn't mention we do a lot of community um, outreach and community programming. And then we also, as I'm a dietitian, we oversee interns and students from Acadia quite often that come on site to do different things. But one of the places that I feel like we are pretty like not as strong as we could be is on our sales and marketing side and having somebody come in and, um, and really help us to share our story outwards and to the community to understand who we are. We have people that live 10 minutes down the road and don't even know that we're there. So how do we get that message out? We're speaking today to people who know about food hubs and what we are, but there's a lot of people out there that don't know what a food hub is, don't see the value in trying to keep the products and things that we grow here in our province here. So somebody to kind of share that kind of, I don't want to call it sales and marketing, but just that knowledge translation and that education piece as to um, what we are and who we're, what we're trying to do. So that's kind of who we'd like to hire. Um, strange that I'm from Newfoundland and Labrador and I'm going to try to answer Josh's question. Um, I can't remember the woman's name, but a woman who owns a trucking company contacted us a couple of months ago and said she'd like to deliver vegetables. I think Crystal Anderson Bags knows who she is. Yeah, and you may already know who she is. I wanted to comment in general about these efforts that we're making to put together pieces of a better food system. When I look at our projects and I think of the fact that I've got that wonderful but unpaid volunteer board and I think like, how the heck did we do 10 projects in the last two years? The answer is students. 
We've had wonderful support from Memorial University, not only in terms of funding, but in terms of students doing co-op terms. And uh, these people that we work with are gorgeous. They're ferocious. You know, hand them one job, you turn around and take a deep breath, and they say, what else? Because they're done with the first one. So we've had a chance to evaluate our goals in depth to create, to help create a map of food availability across the island, so many projects. And the key to us, for us, has been students, student engagement, because they're enthusiastic, they're learning as they go. And the key for us is that we make sure that we keep them happy. And by that, I mean that they, this is a good opportunity for them, that it's satisfying, that there's, they see, they know that they're a full partner, that their voice is honored, and that they're learning what they need to learn as they go. Because the troops are out there. They just need to call on them. Question. I just wanted to quickly add that we, all of our staff, we are, we're very, very close to paying them a living wage. We want to, to know that they are valued and we've not had that difficult of a time attracting people to work at the food hub. Uh, it's quite opposite. We have people approaching us quite often and then we have to, to um, hold resumes and everything because there are people that, um, that want to work for us. But again, we, we want to make sure that um, we are a sustainable business and uh, that we price everything accordingly so that we can actually make sure that our staff are compensated fairly for the work that they do. Uh, we have we have time for a couple more questions. Hi there. Can you hear me through my mask? Yes. <laughs> um, so I've been wondering where to ask this question, and maybe this isn't the right panel, but we've been talking a lot about local, and we're thinking about where food is coming from. And I'm wondering, when we mention farmers, um, something that's been on my mind is migrant workers, and who's actually sort of doing a lot of this labor and thinking about how can these community members who are sometimes here temporarily be woven into our local fabric. And I'm wondering if this aspect of local is sort of being done in the work that you're doing or thinking about that, or I'm mostly just putting it to the room. So thanks. I know several of our producers uh, hire migrant uh, workers throughout the, the season. Um, Iking Farm is a really good one. Um, they actually, they bring in a lot of farmers from Jamaica and South America to come and harvest the produce that they know that is needed in their, their countries. Um, so there, there is quite a bit of it and we do get a lot of tourists coming into Cape Breton for the summer um, that want to be there for a few months and a lot of the farmers will jump in and hire them for the few months that they're there um, just to give them the experience, teach them English for some people and then just be part of the community and I can't speak for the rest of Nova Scotia, but that is one thing Cape Breton is. It's like, come on in, you're welcome. And who's your father? <laughs> Straight up. And <laughs> I'm Irish, you don't know him. So, you know, like, it's, they're, they're very, very welcoming. And the farmers also know that they need that help too, particularly in the summer, because there's so much produce to harvest. So um, the Cape Breton farmers definitely do that. And we have the Cape Breton Partnership who are partnered with us at the Food Hub. So they'll reach out quite often and say, we have somebody new to Cape Breton that wants to move here and become a permanent resident. Can you help them out? So we do, we reach out to the farmers and say, do you have anything they can do? So we are very connected to all those organizations to ensure that we welcome people and they have somewhere to work. Other questions? Thank you for asking that question. Um, I think you might get the award for the uh, have most heavily loaded question of the event award. <laughs> um, I think it's a really great question. And obviously it might not be particularly pertinent to food hubs, but I'm really glad someone brought it up. Um, I know Jen and I employ uh, an all Canadian crew and uh, we're one of the very few. 
and I'm not throwing shade on the migrant worker option. You know, I think a lot of farmers would seriously quit if that program ended. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, I, I think that there is a fundamental challenge of, um, I know from what I've understood and maybe someone could correct me, but I think it's worth saying that a lot of the people in the temporary foreign worker program would want to have a pathway to landed immigrant status. I'll just say that. And that young Canadians, young Canadians who, not only young, new, new entrants to agriculture who are looking for a job in farming have a hard time. And there's very few people left who are employing um, Canadians to grow food here. I think I'm gonna to speak to that too. And partly because growing up in California, we become very aware of the situation for migrant workers. And I had friends who worked actually closely with Cesar Chavez on the grape strike that was happening when I was growing up. So uh, some people are doing it right and some people aren't doing it right. I'm speaking of the way in which workers are paid, housed, treated, et cetera. Uh, whether we should be involving people flying in to do these jobs is a tangly question. And at the same time, it's hard to find people to work even harder now if we are post COVID, I'm not sure if we are. But the thing about it is that there are examples to learn from. The one, the story told in the book, The New Farm is one about treating people right and succeeding and making a profit on your farm. But I think the essential thing is the treating people right part. And I think that's a puzzle in agriculture in general. Uh, the farming population is aging out we know that. And so it's a big question around who's going to do the work. And a little provoking example is that I had a conversation with the current financial manager at the Autism Society in St. John's, which is built with the participation of a group called Iron and Earth, a huge greenhouse, solar greenhouse. And he told me, oh, we're not planning to use a greenhouse anymore with a with our spectrum folks, because it doesn't seem to be a good match for them. I said, well, why not? He said, because the work that you're asking people to do is not just physically demanding, it's intellectually demanding because of the specificity of how you do the work and the knowledge that it takes to do it. And uh, there's kind of the cliche thing, the farmer is, you know, the guy and his wife with the straw hat and the pitchfork and the barn behind him. And then it's, you know, you just throw the seeds and run. But we know it's not like that. It's demanding, complex, and it's evolving. So there's a big knot of string to untangle around how we do the work. That's all I have to say. Anybody else on the panel? Um, I would like to, to comment myself that I think it is appropriate that we treat all farmers with the respect that maybe they haven't had over the years as we have outsourced and become more distant from, from our food. So um, whether they're employees or the farmers themselves, uh, <laughs> Thank a farmer, not just every time you eat. Any other questions? We have one time for one half of a question. <laughs> Colleen. Hello. I just wanted to add a comment to that discussion. I think it's essential to bring up the fact that people uh, in the um, seasonal agricultural worker program and the temporary foreign worker program are provided on farm housing as part of that program and affordable rural housing is one of the main barriers to finding workers on farms as a farm worker and a farmer I work at abundant acres for Jen and David Greenberg so I just wanted to to say in my 12 years of experience working on farms 
um, that's something that really needs to be addressed in the conversation when we're talking about food, food affordability and um, uh, justice when it comes to, to workers and, and people who provide the food on your plate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's... <laughs> Thank you, thank you very, our, our time is up, so. There's one more slice through this cake that I want to point out. <laughs> and that has to not, that does not have to do with farm workers, that has to do with multicultural thinking. Uh, when I go out back uh, at the Mercy Center where I also sit on the board, there's a field and a man named Hamad, who is from Syria, is growing beautiful zucchinis and peppers and beans. And uh, we have all these immigrant cultures adding in to where we are now. And we need to include them as well. And they may be part of helping us sort the puzzle of who lives here and wants to work on farms because many of them are arriving with a, a high level of knowledge experience. Just a thought. Thanks, great thanks to the panel for all your good work and for being part of the way forward. So thank you very much. <laughs>